Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast with your favorite sister in Christ, Aaliyah Renee. And if I'm not your favorite sister in Christ, that's okay. I don't got to be. But do you want to start our friendship off by going on a beautiful, wonderful nature walk um, so we can enjoy God's creation? I personally don't really know good trails, but if you know good trails, I'll try your trails. I'm down. Let's do it. And let's just like take in the beauty of the world that God made. Um, but yeah, welcome to the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast, a place of vulnerability, transformation, and most importantly, communion with God, communion with Jesus, and a place for the Holy Spirit to reign free. I'm so excited for this week's episode. We're going to be talking about comparison and how it really gets us into a lot of ruts in our spiritual lives and how it really sucks out the specialness that comes with how God has designed us and created us. One thing that I love about this podcast is that it's really a place for us not only to have, you know, exhortations and to build ourselves up, but also for us to be vulnerable in the sense of talking about the things that maybe we don't like to talk about. Um, I know, especially for me in my Christian walk, it's hard for me to admit sometimes to others that I'm going through things like dealing with um, anxiety or dealing with a fear of failure or dealing with a lack of faith, or in this case, dealing with comparison. And I want this to be an open forum, a safe space for our Christian brothers and sisters so we can really go to God with the things that are affecting us. Go to God with the things that are weighing us down because he loves us. First Peter 5 verse 7 says that we can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us and he cares about the days where we wake up and we don't feel good in our bodies. He cares when we are looking to the left and to the right instead of looking towards him concerning our calling and the purpose that he's made for us. So we're going to go in the Bible. We're going to talk about how Jesus responds to us when we compare ourselves to others. And we're also going to affirm ourselves and how God created us because I think the more that we understand how uniquely and beautiful God created us, the better and more confident we are um, walking out this walk of faith. And also the less likely we are to fall into the trap of comparison because we realize we're so unique. Trying to compare ourselves to others is futile. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really excited to get started before we begin. Let's say a prayer. So if you are able, please bow your heads and close your eyes. Focus on Jesus. Um, if you're not able to bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's just take a moment to thank God for this day and also thank him for this time and invite him here. Um, Hi, Jesus, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for this day. You have already seen and known what has gone into this podcast. I'm um, thankful that you did something special this week, that you really allowed this to sit in my heart first before I shared it with others. Um, I thank you for this time and this opportunity to, to dwell with you and to dwell in your presence as we dive into your word. Holy Spirit, I want to say you are welcome here. Oh Lord God, I want you to be in our midst as we study your word and the things that you have are and are saying to us. Oh Lord Jesus, I ask that you would clean my hands, clean my heart. Oh Lord God, let me have a posture of just being a vessel for your glory. Speak the things that you want to be heard on this platform. I ask, oh Lord God, that you would allow us to place our vulnerabilities and our feelings of comparison and inadequacy in your hands. And oh Lord God, I ask that you would just take our hearts and guard them and build us up in the fact that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in you. Oh Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, that it is a forever fountain of, of revelations and knowledge um, and something that can give us confidence when we feel like we're crumbling, like we feel like we have nowhere to go. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would prepare our ears, our eyes, um, prepare our hearts for the word that you have for us. Plant the seed into the 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 soil of our hearts and our spirits and our souls and let it spring out and be good ground let us be girded in your word so that we can walk this walk of faith oh lord god with you and with confidence in jesus name we pray amen amen okay so the, we're gonna jump right into the scripture let's go to john chapter 21 okay As you're getting there, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. Okay, so this is actually an exchange um, that is happening between Jesus and Peter. Now, if you remember, Peter was our ride or die disciple. Okay, he is literally the perfect image of what it means to be zealous for God. Sometimes maybe a little over passionate, maybe a little overzealous. um, But he was someone who had a heart for Jesus, right? 
when Jesus was getting arrested in the garden of Gethsemane, Peter was the one who had the sword and sliced off the guard's ear in hopes to save Jesus and to almost in a way protect him. And Jesus was like, no, chill, big homie, we good. Like this all part of the plan. Like wait until three days. They going they definitely not going to be laughing then. And, um, I think it's so cool to just see how human Peter was. Like sometimes we can go through the Bible and just read it to read it. But when we really take it in, when we deep that these are real people, we're able to relate so much more to these, I don't like to call them stories, these accounts of history that happen. And here in John chapter 21, we're seeing Jesus's final moments on earth before he uh, returns to heaven, right? So this is after his resurrection. He does all of these amazing miracles and things. He shows himself to the disciples. They can see the holes in his hands and they can feel the piercing in his side. So they know this is their Messiah. This is Jesus fulfilling the things that he said, the prophecies that were said of him that he would raise again on the third day. And in this final time where Jesus is on earth before he um, goes up to heaven, he actually has an encounter and a conversation with Peter, this disciple that we've been following so long. And also we remember that Peter, Jesus told him before he died that Jesus was going to build his church upon Peter, essentially saying that he would be the foundation of the church when Jesus leaves, a foundation of how the gospels and discipleship was going to be born and propagated throughout the earth. And when we read Acts, we can see that Peter is again fulfilling what Jesus says. Upon the rock of Peter, Jesus' church was built. He is doing wonderful things in Acts. He's defending the faith. He's Holy Spirit filled. He's willing to die for the gospel and willing to die for Jesus, his savior, that just years before he was denying in the courtyard three times. Um, so that's just a little bit of context. Here we're going to find in John chapter 21, right before we get to this point where we're about to read, Jesus gives Peter a command. Jesus gives Peter insight on his ministry and what that will be like. He tells Peter to feed his sheep. Essentially, this is a call of the ministry. He actually tells him three times to feed his sheep, take care of the flock of these hungry souls that are going to be coming into the kingdom through Jesus Christ. So if we start at verse 18, we can kind of see the end of where Jesus is telling um, Peter things. And then we'll see Peter's response to this and probably see ourselves in it a little bit too. So in verse 18 of John chapter 21, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, being Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to Peter, follow me. Now in the NIV, I like it because it's like an exclamation point. He's like, follow me. In French, I believe it's called the imperatif. Like this is a command, right? It's like, go to bed, wake up, um, sit down, stand up. This is a straightforward, no nonsense command of Peter to follow Jesus. So we see that Jesus gives Peter the command and then tells him to follow. Okay. Let's see Peter's response. Does he follow Jesus? What does he do? Well, immediately in verse 12, we see Jesus, Peter doesn't follow Jesus. He actually turns around. Why does, why does Peter turn around? Let's see. It says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Now, if you don't know, this disciple is John. It's interesting because if we think about the history of Peter and John, like even within the short time, um, when the news came to them that Jesus was resurrected after uh, Mary saw that there was an empty tomb, he go she goes to the disciples and she's like, listen, y'all, he's not in the tomb anymore. And Peter and John, again, being referred to as this disciple that Jesus loves, are running after, running to the tomb. And John actually beats Peter to the tomb, right? And he's the first one to get there. Um, even though they were both racing. So it's interesting because even in the context, you can kind of see that it's interesting that the one that Peter is turning and asking Jesus like about is also the same one that a lot of the times he was beating Peter. Like he beat Peter in the race just a, just a couple days ago when they discovered that Jesus was not no longer in the tomb. So here we see that that is almost a thorn in his side where Peter is now looking at the one that Jesus loves. And he says, he says this, he says, when Peter saw him being John, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? So think of this from verse 15 to verse 20, 
Jesus is intimately telling Peter to feed his sheep. He's, he's reinforcing this fact that he's going to build the church of Jesus basically on Peter, this rock. And he gives Peter this call and demand for his life. But the first thing that Peter does is not follow Jesus, which is what Jesus told him to do. Instead, he turns and looks at someone else. And how many times have we received commands from the Lord and immediately we're trying to compare them to the calls of other people? How many times have you received an instruction from the Lord and it's like, why does my instruction look different than theirs? Why does the ministry you want me in not look as glamorous as someone else's? Why does the following or why does the 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 stewardship that you have me over, why does that look different than someone else's? And Peter actually shows us something that we ourselves sometimes do as Christians where we will receive an instruction from God and immediately try to compare it to our peers. Where Jesus' command, lest we forget, the imperative in uh, verse 19, he says, follow me. So when Jesus gives a command, many times he'll say, okay, this is what I want you to do, now follow me. But instead... We take the command and then we're like, wait, but what about him? Like Peter says, turning around, turning our gaze away from Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith, and then turning to other people to try to compare our calling to theirs. Here, Jesus' response when Peter takes the calling that God has given him and then tries to compare it to others being John. Jesus answered Peter and said, if I want him being John to be alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. In the New King James Version, it doesn't even say you must follow me. He says, if I want him to remain until I return, what does that have to do with you? You follow me. And I love that because thinking about how I would do it if I was Jesus, thankfully I'm not Jesus. I'm so happy that Jesus is Jesus because he is the best in the whole world. But if I was there and I was Jesus and Peter's asking about other people, right when I tell you something, an amazing thing, I've revealed this amazing plan for your life. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, but what about him? Um, am I going to be greater than him? Uh, what's he doing? What is he up to? What's your plan for him? And then I'm, um, I'm automatically disappointed because I'm like, I've just told you something so intimate about your life and you're already ready to compare yourself. If I was Jesus, I'd be, my head would be on that uh, 45 degree ankle tilt and my hand would be grasping for air. And I'd be like, what does that have to do with you? Mind your business and follow me. And that's really what Jesus says without all of the sass and the attitude and maybe a little disrespect. He says, focus on yourself. And I think sometimes when we take a moment if we're caught up in comparison of like, why don't I look like them? Why doesn't my ministry have, why don't I have the ministry like them? Why don't I sound like this person? Why am I not as eloquent in speech? Why do I not have this certain gifting that someone else has that I really want or I see myself doing? We have to stop and do what Jesus does to Peter and ask ourselves, what does that have to do with me? What does someone else's ministry and walk have to do with you and your walk and your relationship with Jesus? And if we're honest, the answer is nothing. And that's why that is Jesus's response to Peter. He focused us back in to the fact that a lot of the things that we're focused on about other people, a lot of the things that have our heads turning away from God and the specific calling that he has for us really have nothing to do with us. But the problem is, if you can think about it like this, where Peter was in a place before Instagram was made, before TikTok, before YouTube subscribers, before LinkedIn followers, all of these things. There was not an age of social media where literally we are following other people. The way that you keep up with someone or support someone on Instagram, or if you followed this podcast or my personal Instagram, you followed my account, right? So it's literally like we're built to follow other people when Jesus is telling us, as he told Peter in verse 19, to follow me. And sometimes we get so caught up in the scroll of like, we see something and someone's doing an amazing thing. And we're like, wow, they're doing such great things for ministry. Let me look at their page. And you catch yourself doom scrolling on other people's lives and following them with your eyes. You're seeing what they're doing. You're like, why does my ministry not look like that? Or, oh my gosh, they're younger than me and they're doing all this stuff. Oh my gosh, they're only a year older than me and they've accomplished so much. And you can see where instead of keeping your gaze on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, the one who has a purpose and plan for you, a plan for you to prosper and not to harm you, as it says in Jeremiah 29 11, we're looking to other people and their callings and their promises and their highlight reels on social media. 
And then we wonder why we feel like every single day we're waking up and we're just feeling so drained. We're feeling so unfulfilled. We're feeling so inadequate because instead of pouring yourself into God and instead of allowing him to download into you more about your purpose and plan, you're more fixated on the people that you follow on social media and trying to keep up with the Joneses and look like you're walking in your purpose. But what if what God has you to do isn't as public as you would think? What if the calling that he has for you isn't in front of stages or leading or shepherding a church or having an influence that you might think? What if his influence for you and what if the most fulfilling thing that he has for you is in your local church or just serving people around you? And I really do believe some of the keys to unlocking hearing from God clearer and having a greater perspective on what his call is for your life and what the purpose he has for you in his life is, is to learn how to be content with yourself and your own life. Because I believe God sees some of us being like, oh my goodness, please Lord, give me my calling, give me my purpose. But he also sees our heart of comparison where everything God does in your life, you're comparing every single insight that he gives you of like, Hey, I want you to do go to nursing school. You're like, why, why, why not medical school? Why nursing school? Like sometimes God has such specific plans for us that he wants to entrust in us, but he sees our heart postures and our hearts just aren't ready because we have these seeds of comparison where anything that God would tell you is his plan for your life. You would immediately find a way to think of it less than someone else's calling. Right. And I believe that's some of our shortcomings as Christians. And I think what builds us up in our faith is reminding ourselves that we should be content with any call. We should be content with any calling that God has for us because he's so intentional about giving us a call. Even when it comes to our physical appearances or the way that we are, sometimes I remember back when I was younger, like I was 5'8 in... I think I was 5'8 at like 14. Like I was tall. I was like one of the tallest girls in my class and I would pray to God every night. I'm like, dear God, please don't make me any taller. Please, please, please. Like if you love me, don't make me any taller. If you love me, don't don't make me like have hair that's more coily than other people. Like I would get on my knees and pray to God to change things that he had created about me because I didn't understand how unique he made me and how every single thing that, he placed into my life every single thing that made up who I was was an intentional part of his design for me and were also things that I would be able to use to bring him glory like I have a a unique testimony of being someone that went through being rejected and not having validation because of the way that I looked in my younger years like that it allows me to touch and reach people in a way that I wouldn't be able to if I was always validated and always felt loved being feeling having this feeling of like being different from others allows me to speak to others about being different in a in in a way that resonates more because I lived that experience and some of the things that we 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 are saying to God that we want to change or we don't understand that he's given us are the exact things that he wants us to use for his glory there's so many unique things about us where we're like I wish I was three inches shorter or three inches taller or I wish that I didn't have a stutter or I wish that it wasn't awkward or I wish that my humor wasn't the way it was but once you understand that God intentionally places those things inside of you and makes those things a part of your identity so that you can use them for his glory that is when we stop walking in comparison and walking in content and saying that I'm so content with what, how God has made me because I see how he's going to use this for my testimony. I see how he's going to use these unique things about me to bring him glory. And one of the scriptures that I think really embodies this is one that we talk about all the time, Psalms 139, okay? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I think it's one it's great for us to speak those things over our lives like I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm beautiful da da da. But do we actually know what these words mean when we say them? Unless we take a deeper dive into the some, some of the scriptures that we recite, sometimes we could just say them to say them. But if you don't actually understand and take in and like deep what you're saying, the power that some of these words have, I think these can lose meaning. So what I want to do is actually look at Psalms 139, right? This really recited scripture that we use to stop comparing ourselves and to make ourselves feel more confident and break down exactly what each part means. Okay, so we're going to start at verse 13. I'm only going to go through 13 and 14, but the whole chapter is actually really beautiful and talks about the intimacy of God's knowing of who we are as his children and also talks about the beauty of like he will never leave us or forsake us. So starting here at verse 13, we see David, who is the psalmist who wrote this, talks about God's intimate 
process of designing us even before we were born. So at verse 13, I'm reading from the New King James. It says, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Pause. Now, what's super cool about the NIV is it actually says not you covered me in my mother's womb, but you knit me together in my mother's womb. And speaking of moms, my mom used to knit. Um, she used to knit and crochet when I was younger. And I would see her get yarn out and get her little needles. I don't really know the terminology, so bear with me or educate me in the comments, please. Um, she would sit down and she would like wrap the yarn around each needle and she would take her time and do every single like not stitch, but basically every single stitch, she would weave it in to create this scarf. And then in the end, I would see this beautiful scarf that might have different colors or like a hat or mitts all being created. And when you sit and think that the Bible says that God knit us together, I want you to literally think of like, if you've ever seen someone knitting or just think of someone stitching something together with care, like God sat down he said that you're going to have this eyes, you're going to have these things that are going to make you laugh, you're going to have this hair, These are this is how you're going to speak, um, this is how tall you're going to be. Um, all of these things, he takes his time to knit it together. And when we realize that you weren't just a bunch of atoms like smushed together randomly, you're able to see the beauty in how God took his time to create you. And just thinking that a, a, an almighty amazing, powerful God, the one who created the universe also took the time to create you. That in and of itself should give you a gratitude that you cannot explain. And that in and of itself should give you a confidence to say the God who made the trees, the God who understands ecosystems, the God who makes galaxies and hangs stars in the sky also chose for my hair to be 4C. Also chose for me to be five, six and a half also chose me to have a little bit of a stutter, also chose me to have green eyes or blue eyes, also chose me to have a sense of humor that might be different than other people. When you realize that in, in such as much as the care that he did in creating the beauty of the universe and how everything works together in the universe, he also created every single aspect of you to work together for his good and to give him glory and to bring him glory. So that's just verse 13 telling us that our God is not just a God who is like, okay, let's just throw a bunch of things together and like we have a bunch of random, billions of random humans. No, he intentionally, he looks at us. I believe it's in Jeremiah 1 verse 5. It says, before you were even conceived in your mother's womb, he already had a call for your life, right? So if we understand that that's the care that he puts into our lives, who are we to compare ourselves to other people? Let's keep going. Let's go to verse 14. It says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Let's stop. Let's reverse. Fearfully and wonderfully made. The things that we have in our Instagram bios, the things that we put in our captions, what does it mean? Let's break down the Hebrew words of fearfully and wonderfully. So the Hebrew word definition of fearfully, when you break it down, when it says that you are fearfully made, that means you were made with respect. When we have a fear of God, there's a great reverence or respect for him. And in the same way, he uses that same level of respect and reverence to create you. You were made with reverence. You were made with great honor. You were made with respect. The God of the universe took his time to knit you together in a respectful, honorable way and created you fearfully with the reverence. Like he respects you when he created you in this way. He created you out of love. Yes. And he also created you honorably. So when I think of the, the God of the universe, okay, so the God of the universe took his time to knit me together and then he also made me with honor and he made me with respect. Okay, what does wonderfully mean? Let's keep reading. Wonderfully is more interesting because this means to be distinct, to be separated, to be set apart, to be distinguished. So not only did the God of the universe take his time to put me together, he knit me together, he also makes me with respect and honor. So I'm not just some random clump of cells. I'm not just some random coincidence or a mistake, but he also makes me wonderfully, which means that he made me different for a reason. He made me different on purpose. He didn't want me to be just like everyone else. He set me apart from every single other human because he had a specific plan for us. So for each one of us, God took the time to select our precious little things that made us us. And then he took the time to knit us together in a respectful, honorable way, uniquely different. Like, can we just say thank you, Jesus, for making us honorably making us respectively oh Lord God and you've also made us so different and unique and distinct out of your love for us we thank you that you took the time to knit us 
that we thank you that you have called us even before we were conceived in our mother's womb. You have created us. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to say amen. Seal that prayer. Because once we actually take a second to understand what it took to make us, we wouldn't dare compare ourselves to anyone else. And what's beautiful about God is that he doesn't make mistakes. So we see here in verse 14, it says, marvelous are your works. So reassuring that I'm one of the works that God made. And, and he's, it, these works are called marvelous. The word marvelous means that it's extraordinary. It's wonderful. But another meaning for the word marvelous is something that is hard to fully understand. And I think this is for some of us who have things about us, whether that be our appearance, whether that be some shortcomings we may think we were born with that we have, whether that be a ministry that we don't necessarily like or don't is not necessarily as glamorous as the others. Sometimes there's parts about how God has made us fearfully and wonderfully that we don't understand. And that is what the word marvelous means. It literally means there are certain things about us that we will not fully understand, but we have to have faith in God's design that everything that is about us is specifically for his glory. And when you take an outlook of looking at your life and being like, okay, wait, no, like going back to what I said, being someone who was tall and felt like I was overlooked and felt like I wasn't desirable actually helped me rely more on God for my validation than it did for men or other people in my lives. And now I'm able to speak about it as a testimony on my podcast. If I was just like everyone else, if I was just as desirable, if I had all the traits that I always wanted to have when I was younger, my life would be completely different. And I don't even think I'd be sitting on this podcast right now. 12 year old me did not fully understand what it meant to look awkward and be different and have different likes and tastes. But me now at 24 can say, even though I don't fully understand everything, (laughs) I can, I can truly say that some of the, the things that I was struggling with actually became a pivotal part of my testimony and brought glory to God in my later years. And in the same way, even when you're walking in ministry, you're like, God, I don't fully understand why this is the ministry you asked me to do. Why are you asking me to do a serving ministry versus doing a ministry of like singing and being on on stages and doing all the things? Or even why are you calling me to sing as, you know, a backup singer and not the lead in my choir? But there's so many things that he's orchestrated us for seasons of our of our destinies and our purpose that we're not going to fully understand. But he's it's still marvelous. Nonetheless, he's still done it intentionally for you. And part of this faith walk is having faith in God and that every single situation, every single purpose he's placed us in, every single little quirk about you is intentionally done for his glory. And when we take in that his works are marvelous and the word marvelous means we won't fully understand everything, we can actually walk out of situations where we feel conflicted about who we are. We're not going to look to other people and say, why am I not like them? But say, Lord, why did you make me this way? And how can I give you glory with this? Right? It's so easy for us to have why questions that will lead us to pointing and looking at other people and being like, why am I not like them? But let us be more intentional in saying, okay, Lord, if I know you've made me fearfully and wonderfully with respect and, in, and you've set me apart and there's certain things that I don't understand, help me to understand them. Help me to understand how I can have these things about myself that are so unique that I struggle with, maybe things that I feel like I'm the only one that I can relate to. How can this bring you glory? And when I did that in my life, I was able to actually walk away with gratitude over things that I used to hate about myself. I was able to not look at other people and be like, dang, I wish I was more like them. I wish my ministry was like them. I wish I looked like them. I wish I had as much charisma. I wish I was more outgoing like them. I wish I wasn't such an introvert. But saying, Lord, what do you want me? How do you want me to relate to other people who might be introverts too? How can I bring you glory when I feel like, oh my gosh, I have all of this anxiety and I just don't know what to do. Like, why do I, I feel like God, you made me this way. Like, why am I so anxious? He didn't make us anxious, but sometimes there are so un- there's some unique things about us that we just don't understand, whether that be your appearance or your ministry that he's actually trying to use for his, for his glory. And we have to take the time to ask him what these things are. And that just means getting on your knees in your prayer closet, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what these specific things are. And when you actually hear God's affirmation, about some of the things that make you different and how he wants to use those for his glory, it gives you a different confidence where you don't even want to compare yourself anymore. Um, Yeah, so that's why I think even when we read our scriptures, I believe that this is something that we can take away. Like, let's really dive in and figure out, like, what do these words mean? What does it mean to be fearful? What does it mean to be wonderfully made? And that will give you more confidence um, in your walk with Christ. 
Now I'm going to switch a little bit from talking about like our physical appearance, which I feel like Psalms 139 really does great at being fearfully, wonderfully made, being knit together and talk a little bit about ministry, which I think honestly in these past couple of years, again, because of social media, you could turn on your camera and everybody got a ministry. And I'm one of those people too, right? Like I'm sitting and talking in front of a camera and there has been a ministry that has grown from this. But I think sometimes we have to get down to what God actually has given us as gifts. And then if that is in line with you starting a ministry online, then you should do it. But I think sometimes because we're so consumed in social media, we will look at other people and be like, God, why is my gift not like their gift? And then we're so caught up in other people's gift that we're not even asking God, what is our gift? We're just saying, why is my gift not theirs? We're not asking God, what is the gift that you have given me and how can I use it for your glory? But instead we're saying, why is my gift not that gift? And why have you not shown me my gift yet? But you're not even asking. Instead, you're so caught up in other people. And I've I've been there just like scrolling on my phone saying, when am I going to do something great for God? But I'm not actually seeking God and, and, and going into my secret place and really staying on my knees and saying, Lord, give me a revelation of what you have for my life. Instead, I'm just like vicariously living through others. In Romans 12, chapter four, it actually tells us that just like a body, like we have arms, we have hands, we have fingers, we have eyes, nose, and mouth. The body of Christ has a bunch of different parts um, that are each unique. And it tells us that once we discover the gift that we have, the grace that God has given us, that we should walk out in the authority that he's given us with those gifts. So Romans 12, let's go to verse four. It says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Verse six, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us, period. Let's stop there. Let's highlight that. Literally, the writer of Romans is literally telling us that we have different gifts. We will be different. So social media, Instagram, all the things, everyone having a YouTube channel, maybe that's not your gift. And the moment that God says, you know what, Aaliyah, this is not your gift, I will let it go. Because if it's not my gift, I can't, I will not do it. So it says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us, right? Just thinking back to being fearfully and wonderfully made, there are specific things that God has knitted into our being and our creation that also goes with our ministry and the gifts that we have. So it goes on to say, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is showing mercy, do it cheerfully. And do you see how none of these are like, oh, if it's preaching, go preach. There's like so many other ministries beyond just like preaching or singing on a Sunday and like getting fame and like selling out arenas and giving glory to God in these public stages. But some of these are actually really intimate. If it is serving, then serve. If it's just serving your community, if it's serving your church, if it's working in children's ministry and serving in that way, that could be a grace gift that God has given you. And that could be the fulfillment of your purpose for him. His full purpose for you could just be to serve in your local ministry. And once we realize that, instead of looking to the left and the right, but we do what Jesus said to Peter in John chapter 21 and just follow him. If he's given you a gift and he's given you a ministry, no matter how big and how small, just look to Jesus, just follow him. And whatever he has for you, as you walk out in obedience, he will reveal those things to you. In the same way, look at this one. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Are you telling me that giving encouragement is actually a gift that I can have in the body of Christ? Are you telling me that just being with someone and standing by them if they're going through a hard time, just pouring into them, sending them an encouraging text, like what if that's actually the gift God has given you? And we have to like really reflect on our own lives and what God has for us versus looking at other people because we'll miss out on these gifts if it is to lead, then do it diligently. But if it is to show mercy, what if your gift is to show mercy to other people, to show mercy of the love of Christ? That could be a ministry that God is leading you to, but because it's not as glamorous and we, we are so caught in comparison, we might miss out on the things that God is asking us to do and the purpose that he has for us. So I don't know, like for me, there's many times where I honestly have to log off social media because sometimes I, I'll be on social media like, dang, like maybe my, maybe I need to do this with my podcast. Maybe I need to do that. Maybe I shouldn't even be doing a podcast. Maybe I should be doing a podcast plus this. And maybe I should be doing that. And I think God has really been speaking to me like, 
not everyone's a Christian influencer. I don't think I'm necessarily a Christian. I think I'm just a girl sitting and doing Bible studies. And there was a point where I'm like, okay, I need to post a story every day. And then I need to post, um, Instagram pictures with, uh, Bible captions every week. And then I need to post reels. And then, and then I'm like, wait, but is this what God is calling me to do? Maybe it's just find me in the secret place podcast. Maybe for this season or forever, this is, this is the grace that he's given me to just teach. Maybe my gift is not to be an influencer because I think there is a gift that comes with being able to engage with social media in a God-fearing way and then to also bring glory to God through Instagram or TikTok and having witty ideas and trends and things like that. I think there's a gift for that and I think that's a grace and that can also be a part of evangelistic ministry because you're spreading his word and encouraging his people in a new way. And maybe some of us don't have that gifting, like maybe... There was a point in my life where I was like, I need to also, I need to be a podcaster and a teacher, but I also need to be a Christian influencer because that just makes sense, right? That's what everyone else is doing. But if that's not the call that he has in your life, it's okay if that's not the walk you take. And because I was comparing myself to other people, I was like, I need to fit in this box of what everyone's doing. And I need to not only have a successful podcast, but a pop in Instagram and everything else in between. And I need to be consistent on like every single app ever created. And I need to communicate with people all the time. But if that's not the anointing and the grace God has given me, I found myself doing that. And I was like run ragged. I was not doing well like in terms of like mental health, because I was just trying to be something that God didn't call me to be. But because I was caught in comparison, I thought looking at other people, I wasn't looking at God. I wasn't asking him what he wanted me to do. I was just like, okay, um, I know God gave me, you gave me this calling like you gave to Peter, but what about him? He's doing this. She's doing that. So let me start posting and let me do this and let me do that. And then we catch ourselves serving other people and what we think is the right thing to do versus what God is actually asking us to do. So if you need to unplug from social media and dive back into the Lord to really get your focus right and follow Jesus and get your ministry right, especially if you're someone who thinks you're called to like digital ministry on top of like serving in your actual physical church, that is a, you need a grace for that and you need God's direction for that. So definitely I I always condone a media fast. I love a good media fast. If you need to step away, you can step away. It is absolutely fine to get clarity from God in that regard. The last scripture that I want to end with is Romans uh, chapter nine. This is one that hit me hard because I think sometimes we find ourselves questioning God about how he's made us. And this scripture actually like gave me a little gentle slap and said a little gentle rebuke and said, look how you sound questioning God about how you're made. So if we go to Romans chapter nine, verse 20, it says, but who are you a human being talking back to God? We already starting off. We already starting off crazy, which is true. Who are we sometimes looking to God and being like, God, why didn't you make me this way? God, why does this person have this ministry? But I don't God, I think you should have made me taller or you should have made me shorter or you should have changed this about me or you should have made me born in this state or this city. Who are you, a human being, talking to the God that created you? Talking to the literal creator of the universe. Like, fix your tone, watch your tone, who are you talking to? And then we continue in verse 21. It says, does not the potter, being God, have the right to make out the same lump of clay, being us, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Does God, if we really think about it, does he not have the authority? Does our creator not have the authority to designate and design us for whatever he causes us to be for? Whatever he desires us to do. Does he not have the authority to do that? The creator of the universe, the one who knitted you together so specifically, so fearfully and wonderfully, so distinctly from others. Does he not also have the right to call you to specific ministries at specific times of your life? And once we give sovereignty back to God, as his creation and not try to dictate what God has for our lives. It'll allow us to accept his call for us much sooner, be able to walk into that purpose that he has for us and live more fulfilling and full lives, living out the ministries he has for us, no matter how big or how small. But it will also help us stop comparing ourselves to other because we have so much confidence in how the potter has molded us as clay. And that's really what I had for you this podcast episode. If you have made it this far, oh my goodness, the opposition is so real. Um, I recorded this one time and I feel like that was just like my time to receive the word. And then there was just so much distractions going on, but I really feel like that doesn't take away from the beauty of God's word. Oh, and one more thing that I want to say, if you still are walking away from this, you're like, oh my gosh, Aaliyah, what do I do if I'm immediately being assaulted 
with these thoughts in my head and like, I feel like I want to compare myself to others. I feel inadequate. You should do what it says in second Corinthians 10 verse five to take your thoughts captive, right? So you're going to, if you feel yourself going down that line of thought, you're going to take it captive. So stop the line of thought, make it obedient to Christ Jesus. The best way that you can fill your mind and remove those things of comparison is to fill your mind with the scripture. Think back to Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. When I know that the God who has created me has a plan specific for me and how he created me, I cannot second guess how I was made. I cannot second guess my ministry because I know that my God loves me so much that he would never place me somewhere that he hasn't ordained for me to prosper and to give me hope in a future. Jeremiah 1 verse 5, I also love because it it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. He appointed, in this case, Jeremiah to be a prophet among the nations. And in the same way, he's consecrated us even before we were formed as soon, even before the, the egg and the zygote met in your mother's womb. He designed you in a beautiful way. And you have to continuously change and renew your mind, as it says in Romans 12 verse 2, with the word of God, so that you're built up in such a way that anytime thoughts of comparisons come, you say, no, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, as it says in Psalms 139. No, actually, God has a purpose and plan for me, as it says in Jeremiah 29, 11. No, the way that I'm made and I was born was for such a time as this, as it says in Esther 4 verse 14. Like, once we realize that God has created us uniquely, and he has a unique purpose for us, the uniqueness and differentness of who we are doesn't cause us to compare ourselves, but builds our confidence. And it's a practice. It's something you have to walk out because we can look in the mirror for hours and hours and stare at ourselves and pick out everything we hate about ourselves. But what we need to do is start affirming ourselves in the word of God. And also if we feel lost about our purpose and our ministries and our destinies, and we see other people doing great things, get on your knees in the prayer closet, get off of Instagram and scrolling and looking at other people and being like, maybe I should do that because she's doing it or he's doing it. Instead, get on your knees and intensify your prayer to the Lord and start to live a life of having happiness and being content with what God has given you so that he can continue to see you as a good steward for the rest of the purpose and plan that he has for your life. And those are just things that have helped me, especially in my formative years. Um, and that's what I wanted to share on this podcast. And I pray that it really blessed you. Um, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Let's have a discussion. I read all of the comments, um, and I love seeing what you all have to say. I know comparison is really hard, so share some scriptures that build you up in the comments. Um, even on Spotify, you can share comments and your thoughts on the episode. I would love to hear what you think. If you are one of those people who have been DMing me or messaging me about how you can support the ministry of God is leading you to support me in any way, the best way to do so is to click the three dots at the bottom of this video and then there will be a thanks option in the drop down and you can use that to actually give um, and support the ministry if you're led definitely not required at all because you just being here and supporting me and showing love and just communing with the holy spirit and dwelling in the word of god with me is enough like that is more than fulfilling but people do ask so i've made a place for you to do so here um also we have our request form so please make sure to write down your requests this episode was inspired by the holy spirit and what he had been working with me on but i also noticed that there were a couple requests talking about comparison and almost like idolizing others in our little request form so if you have a request that you would like to hear on this season or next season of the find me in the secret place podcast please make sure to leave it there. My social medias are also linked down below. If you want to know about what Bibles I use or the equipment that I use, those are also down below as well. And I just pray you're blessed and I will see you all next week. Bye.